Good evening and welcome to Tucker Carlson. Tonight we just landed from Helsinki back in the nation's capital where it is hot and intense. We're going to have our full extended interview with the president from Helsinki. We're going to show that to you in just a minute. We asked him, of course, about Russia, but there are, believe it or not, many more important and pressing issues on the world stage, not just Russia. And we asked the president about those as well. We'll bring the whole thing to you coming up in just a second. But first, tonight, with remarkable speed and intensity, the media and the foreign policy establishment, both political parties, have come together as one to attack the president for his meeting yesterday with the Russian president, Vladimir Putin. Anderson Cooper, John McCain, Mitt Romney, they all described the president's remarks about Russia as disgraceful. Former CIA director John Brennan called those remarks treasonous and grounds for impeachment. Nancy Pelosi and Chuck Schumer announced that Trump was being blackmailed by a foreign power. Others accused him of being a sleeper agent, a spy. One member of Congress from Tennessee called for a military coup against the presidency. Well, as the rage storm swirled, the president bowed to the inevitable, genuflecting before U.S. intelligence agencies whose judgment must never be questioned, and recited the now obligatory oath of loyalty to the spy bureaucrats now in charge of our country. Watch. In a key sentence in my remarks, I said the word would instead of wouldn't. The sentence should have been, I don't see any reason why I wouldn't or why it wouldn't be Russia. So just to repeat it, I said the word would instead of wouldn't. And the sentence should have been, and I thought it would be maybe a little bit unclear on the transcript or unclear on the actual video. The sentence should have been, I don't see any reason why it wouldn't be Russia. Sort of a double negative. So you can put that in, and I think that probably clarifies things pretty good by itself. So that's the hostage tape. The president buckled to criticism. I don't know what they're saying. That's exactly what happened. He buckled. And that happens. This is politics, after all. What is amazing and unusual and ominous is who made him buckle. The people yelling the loudest about how the Russians are our greatest enemy and Trump is their puppet happen to be the very same people who have been mismanaging our foreign policy for the past two decades. The people who invaded Iraq and wouldn't admit it was a mistake. The people who killed Muammar Gaddafi for no obvious reason and prolonged the horrible Syrian civil war and then threw open the borders of Europe. The ones still defending the pointless Afghan conflict and even now planning brand new disasters around the world in Lebanon, Iran and yes, in Russia. These are the people who've made America weaker and poorer and sadder. The group whose failures got Trump elected in the first place. You would think by this late date they would be discredited completely and unemployable, wearing uniforms and picking up trash by the side of a turnpike somewhere. But no, they're not. They're hosting cable news shows. They're holding high positions of influence at the State Department. They run virtually every nonprofit public policy institution in Washington. They are still, in some sense, in charge of our national conversation. And naturally, they hate the idea of rethinking or correcting any of the countless blunders they have made over the years. And that's one of the main reasons they hate Trump, because he calls them on those blunders. Now, being Trump, he can't always explain precisely what he means to say. Sometimes he gets the details wrong, or he gets sidetracked with some personal vendetta, as if anybody cares about that ridiculous Jim Acosta guy. Nobody does. But on the big questions, Trump is indisputably right. The Cold War is over. The world has changed. It is time to rethink America's alliances and to act in our own interest for once. Russia is not a close friend of the United States. But the question is, why should we consider Russia a mortal enemy? Of course Russia spies on us. So do a lot of countries, some of them far more effectively than Russia. The Russian attempt to meddle in our election was comically amateurish. Badly targeted Facebook ads almost nobody saw. Compare that effort to the deep penetration of American industry and the defense sector by the communist government of China, or compared to the remarkable sway that the Sunni Gulf states have over our political process, or the fact that Latin American countries are changing election outcomes here by forcing demographic change on this country at a rate that American voters consistently say they don't want. Those are all major challenges from foreign powers to our American democracy. They're real. And yet somehow nobody on cable news seems upset about any of it. Why is that? Well, here's one reason. Many in Washington are getting rich from the Chinese and the Saudis. Latin Americans clean their homes and watch their kids. Those countries can't be our enemies, in their view. But nobody here is getting rich from Russia, so therefore Putin must be a mortal foe. 
That's what the neocons are telling us we are required to believe. Does anyone actually believe it? Well, no sober person who's read a newspaper this year could recite that talking point without laughing because it's stupid. So the only option, if you want to force the population to accept something ridiculous, is to make sure they don't think too much about it, that they're quiet, they do what they're told. And if you don't believe it, watch what's happening to Trump right now. Obviously, it's possible, entirely possible, maybe likely that the Russian government broke into the DNC servers before the last election. It certainly sounds like something they might do. But before we act like we know for a fact that that's what happened and go to war with Russia over that, shouldn't we see some actual evidence that it happened? Why not? Like maybe a server or at least a clear explanation of what happened. We haven't seen that. And that's what Trump asked for. How dare he? That's a treasonous thought, we were told. He's a quisling, a traitor to his country. That's what they're saying. And not just a few of them. All of them are saying that in unison. Think for a second about what they are demanding. If you don't automatically accept the imprecise, nonspecific, never fully explained findings of shadowy intelligence agencies with long, documented track records of making serious mistakes, you've somehow betrayed your country. The very people who assured you that Iraq had weapons of mass destruction, ones who said the Shah would never fall in Iran, et cetera, et cetera, those people must be believed without question or else. On television, this group is called the Intelligence Community. That's an Orwellian name if there ever was one. Where exactly is this community we hear so much about? Does it have a zip code, a public library system, a youth football league? How long before Congress starts demanding unthinking obedience to the lawmaker community? It's a community, after all. You must obey it. Dissent is unpatriotic. And if you don't agree, you're working for Vladimir Putin. That's where we're heading, by the way, and fast. In some ways, this whole story is about Donald Trump and what he said and what he does. But on a deeper level, it has nothing to do with Donald Trump. This is about democracy, whether or not voters rule their country. It turns out the very people telling you they are saving our democracy are working overtime to destroy it and scolding you as they do. Yesterday, we asked the president about this, along with many other issues. Tonight, we're running fewer commercials and airing our extended interview with the president. Here's part one of that conversation. Mr. President, thanks for doing this. Thank you. The reaction to your press conference in Washington was swift and intense. Former CIA Director John Brennan described it as treasonous and a, a potentially impeachable offense. Why the push toward conflict with Russia in Washington on both sides? Well, I think Brennan's a very bad guy, and if you look at it, a lot of things happened under his watch. I think he's a very bad person. Uh, I also think that when you watch Peter Strzok and Lisa Page, when you watch all of the things that have happened in Com happened Comey, take a look at that, and McCabe, who's got some pretty big problems, I assume. Uh, you look at the deception, the lies, what's gone on in the last fairly long period of time, before I won. I mean, long before I won, during the campaign, I guess probably during the uh, Republican, you know, when I was fighting against uh, 17 other Republicans. So this has been going on for a long time, but these are people that, in my opinion, are truly, they're bad people, and they're being exposed for what they are, and it's a shame that it has to happen, but it's really hurt our country. Their view is that the United States is forever in conflict with Russia, which is our chief global adversary, and anyone who doesn't believe that is betraying the United States. Without taking up whether that's true or not, why do you think there is this bipartisan consensus on that in Washington? Well, it's sort of incredible, because you'd look at World War I and World War II, that was Germany, and in World War II, Russia lost 50 million people and helped us win the war. And I was saying to myself the other day, I said, you know, Russia really helped us. Now, I'm not pro-Russia, pro-anybody. I just want to have this country be safe. I don't want nuclear weapons, uh, even people thinking about it. You know, Russia and the United States control 90% of the nuclear weapons in the world. And getting along with Russia, and not only for that reason, that's a good thing, not a bad thing. Are they our chief adversary, would you say? Well, they're a strong military, uh, but their economy is much smaller, as you know, than China. And I don't want to even use the word adversary. We can all work together. We can do great. Everybody can do well, and we can live in peace. But uh, I think it's very, very important, you know, and, and I've watched your show a lot, and I see how you're talking about the, mag really, the magnificent size of China. You look at the size of what they've done in a fairly short period of time. That's because of a lot of bad leadership on behalf of the United States. We allowed that to happen. We allowed them to make hundreds of billions of dollars. 
And right now, as you see, and you probably have noticed, that things are happening. We have to bring it more into line. We have to level the playing field between the United States and China. And we've increased our net worth. We've increased our worth by more than $7 trillion since the election. And we're about twice the size of China, our economy. But China still is a massive economy. They have the second biggest by far. So NATO. NATO was created chiefly to prevent the Russians from invading Western Europe. I, I think you don't believe Western Europe's at risk of being invaded by Russia right now. So what is the purpose of NATO right now? Well, that was the purpose. And uh, right? it's OK. It's fine. But they have to pay. And they weren't paying. And other presidents went and they'd make a speech and then they'd leave and nothing would happen. And, you know, the fact that they didn't pay is not, you know, new. It's not a new fact. This is something that people have known for a long time. Other countries were delinquent. You know, in the real estate business, we use the word delinquent. They didn't pay. They didn't pay for past. So I went there three, four days ago, and I said, folks, you got to pay, because we're not going to pay from 70 to 90, and I think 90 is really the right, you know, depending on the way you define it, 90 percent. We're not going to pay 90 percent of the cost to defend Europe. And on top of that, the European Union kills us on trade. We lost $151 billion last year on trade. They don't take our product. They don't take our farmers' beautiful goods. They don't take our cars. And if they do, the rate of tax is many times what we would charge them. We only charge them 2.5%. Uh, their tax, their tariff is, is very substantially right. higher. I mean, in the case of China, we charge 2.5% when they send a car. And when we send a car into China, they charge us 25%. How is that fair trade? You know, people say, oh, we want to keep, we don't want tariffs. But how is that fair when one country gets 25 percent and another country gets two and a half percent? And by the way, the one getting 25 doesn't even want the cars. They want them to build those factories. They want those factories built in China. They want those factories built in Europe. So now we're doing things that have never been done before in this country, and you see what's going on. It's been very pleasant so to watch. So membership in NATO obligates the members to defend any other member that's attacked. That's so right. let's say Montenegro, which joined last year, is attacked. Right. Why should my son go to Montenegro to defend it from attack? I Why is that? I understand what you're saying. I've asked the same question. You know, uh, Montenegro is a tiny country with very strong people. Yeah, I'm not against Montenegro uh, right. or Albania. No, by the way, they're very strong people. They're very aggressive people. They may get aggressive. And congratulations, you're in World War III. Now, uh, I understand that, the, but that's the way it was set up. Don't forget, I just got here a little more than a year and a half ago. Right. But I took over uh, the conversation three or four days ago, and I said, you have to pay. You have to pay. And the Secretary General said that because of President Trump, Last year, we had an additional $44 billion, with a B, billion dollars raised for NATO. And this year, it's going to be much more than that. And the countries all agreed. It was very unfair. They weren't paying. So we're not only are we paying for most of it, but they weren't even paying. And we're protecting them. Add that to your little equation on Montenegro. As you traveled around Europe and looked at Europe over the years, can you think of a place that has been improved by mass immigration or the of movements of large numbers of refugees? Not one. Not one. And in fact, one of my big things, and some people were insulted. I'll tell you, a year ago, they would have been totally insulted. Now, maybe there could have been a couple out of all of those countries. I said, the immigration policies in Europe are a disaster. You're destroying Europe. You're destroying the culture of Europe. Uh, the crime is up in those areas. And you better do something. I tell them that. I say, look, it's not me. It's not anything. You just look at the numbers. The numbers speak. But the culture is changing rapidly, and the crime rate is changing more than rapidly. You better do something. I told them that. What are the lessons for us watching that? Well, we have to be very strong on the border. Now, we're much stronger than we ever were on the border, and our numbers are much lower. But still, uh, we're getting the wall. We're going to have we're putting in for about $5 billion. We've already started, well, $1.6 billion. Uh, it started in San Diego, California. It's almost completed in that area. And by the way, the people were really asking for it. You know, it's interesting. They probably uh, go down as, oh, we don't want the wall. But when it came to their backyard, they wanted that wall, and they wanted it up fast. But we've started the wall. We are going to continue with the wall. It's so necessary. But we have to have strong immigration policies. Our laws are so bad, Tucker. Somebody comes in, and they step on our land. And now we end up with a court case that takes seven years, but the people never show up to court. It's so bad, and we have to do something about it. Like, if they come into our land, we have to say, I'm sorry, you have to leave. 
not, I'm sorry, please come to court. We're going to put you in court. You'll come back in three years for your travel, and then they never show up. That's, what, that's what's happening now. It's crazy. Why do you think so many political and cultural leaders in the United States disagree with you? and are making the case that borders are themselves immoral. It's incredible. I mean, the Democrats are for open borders, which means crime. It's, it's not a question of like, you know, what do you think it means? Open borders. Because ICE is tougher than they are. And now I understand there's a big move to try and get rid of ICE. But better because it's more painful. These are vicious people, and you, you know the story. You cover it plenty. And ICE goes in, and they get them out. They get them out. They put them in jail, or they throw them out of the country, and they don't even think about it. And now there's a move on to get rid of ICE because ICE is tough. If you don't have tough people doing that job, you're going to have crime like you've never seen it. So uh, it, it is incredible. The Democrats want open borders, which is basically saying we want open borders, we want crime. Why do you think they want that? Uh, maybe it's a political philosophy that they grew up with. Maybe they learned it at school. Maybe they're fools. I don't know. We'll have part two of our exclusive extended interview with the President of the United States in just a minute. But first, Professor Steve Cohen is one of the famous Russia experts, the eminent Russia experts in America. He's Professor Emeritus at NYU, was at Princeton for many years, now a contributing editor at The Nation magazine. And he joins us tonight for some perspective on this conversation about Russia. Um, Professor, you have followed this country for 50 years and know many of its leaders personally. Give us a sense of what's at stake in this conversation about Russia for the United States? For 75 years, the President of the United States, beginning with Roosevelt, has met the leader of the Kremlin. Beginning with Eisenhower in the atomic age, the main purpose was to avoid war with Russia. Right now, we are in a new Cold War fraught with hot war from Ukraine to the Baltic region to Syria. President Trump did not have a choice. He had to go, as his predecessors did, to meet with the leader of the Kremlin, Putin. And he did. We don't know exactly what they decided. We will learn. But never, never, not only in my lifetime or history, has a president coming back from doing his duty to avoid war with Russia been greeted with this pornography passing as news analysis and commentary. He is literally being called traitorous, uh, treasonous. And I don't know what we're going to do, because if we can't discuss the issue, how can we think about our policy? But there is a good piece of news, and I'll state it quickly. Ever since the Soviet Union ended, relations with Russia have gotten worse and worse, and now we are where we are. And we ask ourselves, why did that happen? Communism is gone, the Soviet Union is gone. And the answer here is always, it's an orthodoxy. It's, it's biblical. You can't dissent from it without being accused of being pro-Kremlin. The answer is, Russia's to blame. Putin's to blame. The United States has done nothing wrong. And now, the President of the United States has said, some, has said something absolutely heretical. He said it first in a tweet, and then after the meeting with Putin. And it was very simple, but it was profoundly true. He said, we have bad relations today because both sides are to blame. And I think that's what underlies their fury at him, that he has become a heretic in the American policy system. He has, he has challenged the fundamental axiom Yes. of American foreign policy for 25 years. Well, and it's stupid. I mean, what, what's true in foreign relations is true in marriage. It's always a joint effort to screw something up. Um, so quickly, <laughs> he, it is true, actually, well, um, as you know. But I'm, not so, going, I'm not going there, no matter what you say. <laughs> Give us a sense, quickly, of the consequences of what's at stake here. I think for a lot of Americans, this is a political story, but it's also a geopolitical story. This is a country with a lot of weapons that sees the world very differently from us. So what are we playing with here? All right, leave this Russiagate aside because I can't find a fact to support it. What President Trump has done, and in this regard, though I didn't vote for him, I say three cheers for President Trump. He has said, look, we are in a dangerous situation with Russia, and it's not that just Russia that's to blame. We are to blame. We did wrong-headed things back in the 90s. 
and sense. What we need to do, this is me speaking now, having acknowledged that, is have a discussion of where our policy toward Russia went wrong. First under Clinton, then under Bush, then under Obama. It is a fully bipartisan, but what Trump has given us, if the media would allow him, is an opportunity to rethink. And if you don't rethink, how do you get policy right? And if you don't get policy right, we are talking about war. Yeah, well, this is a city like Seinfeld that refuses to learn anything, ever. <laughs> Professor, thank you very much. It's great to see you. Up next, a Democratic lawmaker says the summit meeting yesterday between the president and Vladimir Putin was literally treason against this country. He joins us next to explain. Also, the president talked to us about a lot more. Some of what he said may be surprising. Our extended interview with him is just ahead. And so we'll have time for it. We'll be back in just 60 seconds. See you in a second. up the definition of treason as soon as people started saying this was treason and indeed it is it's just as serious to me as the cuban missile crisis in terms of an attack or the 9-11 attack the president is taking the side of the people who attacked us instead of trying to prevent a future attack i would say that his performance today will live in infamy as much mm -hmm. as the pearl harbor attack or crystal knock Imagine hosting that show and somebody says, this is really like Pearl Harbor or Crystal Knox. Wouldn't you say, what? But they didn't. Nothing is being held back uh, in this conversation about Russia, this mass hysteria, lost elections and policy changes are part of being a democracy, but some literally in the Congress are rooting for a military government or a world war or both. Congressman Adam Smith is a Democrat who represents Washington. Yesterday he released a statement describing Trump's remarks in Helsinki as, quote, treason. He joins us now. Uh, to explain that. Congressman, thanks a lot for coming on. Thank so you. you don't agree with the president's view of how the United States ought to approach, approach Russia. That's a policy disagreement. Um, yeah, no, that, that's, that's treason. That's no, that's not. And let me just say, um, as I understand the law now, as I look at it, the president is, the, the remedy for a crime by the president is impeachment. Um, so treason is, is the wrong thing. Why is it a crime to disagree with you? And who's the fascist here? Well, let me, let, <laughs> let, seriously, let me tell you about the crime. Okay. Um, the FBI just yesterday, uh, not yesterday, a couple days ago now, indicted 12 high-ranking Russian officials for hacking into and influencing the U.S. election. Now, I know there's a lot of dispute but within, I'm not disputing it. That within happened. our intelligence community, it absolutely happened. And the president of the United States has systematically tried to undermine the investigation to do that, leading right up to saying in front of the international community, basically siding with the hostile foreign power. We have a hostile foreign power who attacked. Oh, so doubting the conclusions of the intel community is now treason. It's a crime to well, doubt what an intel agency side says. With the hostile foreign power that to have to have opinions you don't like and to ask questions about the conclusions the imprecise and never fully explained conclusions of an powerful American they have been fully explained really yeah they have yes I've been following very carefully and I have a lot of questions I'm gonna, that, am I'm I gonna, committing a crime and asking them uh, absolutely not I'm gonna need more than 10 seconds to explain this okay so I will try where's the crime um, the crime is basically that they hacked into our DNC server and other servers and did a whole bunch of other disinformation campaigns to try to influence our election a foreign power tried to do that that is clearly the crime also in this indictment, it shows that the 12 Russian operatives had regular contact with high-ranking Trump campaign oh, officials. Okay, but, no, I'm sorry. I, 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 my fault. I didn't clarify. What is the crime that the president committed in doubting the indictments? And these are, these are indictments. This is not the product of a jury trial, right? Okay. These are charges. The crime so by definition, they're not proven. So, but you're saying that if you doubt charges brought by the government against somebody, you're a criminal. No, I'm saying that if you attempt to obstruct the investigation, how is you he are attempting criminal. to obstruct it by well, doubting he, it on stage yesterday? Well, he is siding with a foreign power. Over but having the same opinion as Vladimir Putin on something is a crime. Um, basically, undermining the ability to do the investigation is how does it undermine by disagreeing or asking questions? Like, so, so, I was there yesterday in the Helsinki, and Trump said. Right. I, th I didn't agree with everything Trump said. I agree right. with this. Where's the server? Exactly. Well, the why server, didn't the FBI I examine the server? I think that's a fair question. I don't know the answer to that question. I do know the answer to that question. Okay, but, but I don't. So does that make me a criminal you, for asking? No. 
criminal. Not at all. But you're saying the president is. No, he's not a criminal for asking that question. He's not a criminal, period. He potentially has committed impeachable crimes. Well, you said he committed treason in the statement. And as I said, that was an overstatement, and I did not understand the term of art where treason is concerned. Okay, but he committed so, a crime. I mean, whatever you call it, a high crime well, and misdemeanor, a crime. Yeah. You get impeached for a crime, as you know. Yeah, high crime and misdemeanor. Okay. It actually doesn't have but to be where's a crime. the crime? Why is it a crime? So what scares me about you is that as a lawmaker, you would even think that disagreement is a crime. It is not. I do but not think that But you said that, that it was. No, I didn't. You said that I said that it was. Okay, I have so not said that it was. What I have said consistently is what Trump did trying to get Comey to back off of Flynn, what Trump did in firing Comey, what Trump has done consistently calling this investigation a witch hunt and fake news, trying to... You're not allowed to call it... So you're not allowed to criticize the investigation. Turn. Are you allowed... To, am I allowed to criticize the FBI? Will you arrest me if I do? What if uh, I think the FBI is no, going you, you, you can absolutely do that. But if you are the oh, president of the United States the president can't. and you take steps to undermine the investigation... Why is it... Wait, hold on. Why is expressing your opinion and undermining it. So, like, I, I wouldn't well, use the term witch out. hunt, well, but, he, he but skipped over a very important thing here. You issued a statement after a public press conference yesterday where the president spoke on camera yes. to the world, and there was something about what he said yesterday that you believe constitutes a crime. And that's a threat, I think, to all of us if we have lawmakers saying that public remarks are a criminal act. And so I just want to get really precise about what he did yesterday that you believe qualifies him for an impeachment trial. He was undermining the investigation by siding with the foreign power that committed the crime over our own Justice Department after issuing those indictments. And as president of the United States, unlike you or me or anybody else, he's the head of this investigation. Technically, he's the president. He's in charge well, of the Justice the Department. Actually he's in charge of all of no, it. No, we right. have an independent counsel, right. as you know. And who he has the right to fire. If he fired him, you would impeach him for firing? I mean, why do you come on the show and play silly games with me? I'm not he playing fired, silly he's games. He's the head of the investigation. It's an independent counsel investigation. He, the whole point of it is he has the head of step it. after step after step attempted to undermine this investigation. Okay, well, I'm, you're making me want to criticize my government even more because I believe it's my patriotic right. It is your patriotic okay, right. Okay, but I'm worried you're going to accuse me of a crime, as you just did to another American citizen yesterday for disagreeing right. with you. I did not accuse him of a crime for disagreeing with me. I accused him of a crime for trying to cover up what the Russians did. That's the bottom line. I'm missing the distinction. And, and I think... also, I said in my okay. statement that we should see Mueller's investigation before we proceed with any of this. I, don't I absolutely know. I don't think that. people who believe that dissent is criminal should be entrusted with power. Do you? I just said that I wanted to see Mueller's investigation okay. before we go forward with this. Right. I will say it was not well chosen, but I will absolutely right. say, you know, I'm not the only one. I mean, George. No, I know. That's why I'm so worried I, about this moment. We're, George I'm being told will for the fifth time, Radrich. I'm aware. Other people there are a lot of people who are saying this is absolutely is a crime. Wrong. And I, as I, the last of libertarian in Washington, it is not dissent. Wrong. What is a crime is right. covering up and obstructing justice. Yes, yeah. okay. Obstructing All right. justice. Now they're barking at me. I got to go. Congressman, stop. thank you for explaining that. It's nice to see you. I appreciate thank the chance. It's good to see you. We apologize for the audio issues we had during that segment. Part two of our full extended interview with the president in Helsinki is after the break. Thanks. Now, the second half of our interview from Helsinki with the president, he had a lot to say about the Mueller indictments. Very interesting exchange on Angela Merkel whether she or Vladimir Putin is a better leader for their people and more. Here it is. President. You spoke with the Russian president about um, the hacking of the DNC yeah. servers. Yeah. Those indictments were announced just a couple of days before you left on your European swing. Right. What do you think of the timing of those indictments? Well, I don't think of the timing as much as I think of other timing. Uh, Barack Obama was president. I wasn't, prom I wasn't president when this happened. Barack Obama was the president of the United States when all of this, this was pre, this was when I was getting elected. So I was being elected and I guess I assume this stuff all took place in that area or before. And he was president and they informed him of it and he did nothing. And then after I won, see, he thought Hillary was going to win. After I won, he said, oh, this is a big deal. Well, it wasn't a big deal as long as she won. So it's a disgrace. And frankly, it's a disgrace what's happening to our country. Would it be possible for you to direct the Department of Justice, FBI, to take possession of the server and have, assuming no government investigators looked at it, which seems to be the case right now, and get to the bottom of it? So, as I've told you, and the answer is absolutely it is possible, and be 
At some point, it'll be done. But I've wanted to stay out. My Department of Justice is the one branch, the one group that I'm very little involved in. Same with the FBI. Uh, am I disappointed that they're not looking at all of the crooked things taking place on the other side? Like the Pakistani man who left with these three servers, knew everything about Schultz, knew, knew everything. Debbie Wasserman Schultz. And I think he had three servers. I believe they even have them, and they don't want to use them. Or the DNC, where the server was never taken by the FBI. They went in there, and Podesta or somebody threw them out of the office. They said, get out of here. And yet they go after other people like there's no tomorrow. Uh, so I have purposely, and you understand that. I spoke to you about it before. Uh, as they said, you're winning. Don't get involved, because I don't want to have people accuse me of anything. So I've stayed very much uninvolved. But uh, am I allowed to be involved? Totally. Will I be involved? We'll have to see as it goes along. I mean, right now, people are finding out a lot of things that they never thought. And in all fairness to the IG report, uh, it was an unbelievable report, except at the end, where they sort of tried to be politically correct. But when you talk about bias, there's never been bias like that. Now, Strzok, on the other hand, was, you know, that was total bias. But uh, that report was a good report, except for the basic conclusion. So, finally, on Europe. Which wasn't even bad. Having met with, talked to, watched carefully Angela Merkel in Germany, Vladimir Putin in Russia, who do you think, from the perspective of their countries, does a better job representing the interest, again, of their countries? So, uh, Angela was a superstar until she allowed millions of people to come into Germany. That really hurt her badly, as you know. Uh, she was unbeatable in any election. She allowed millions of people to come in. And when they came into Germany, they passed everywhere else, and they went to lots of other countries, although Hungary would not take any, and a lot of people wouldn't. But what happened is it was the Great Migration. And Obviously, it's hurt Angela very much. So I don't want to say who's better, who's not better, but I will say this. Uh, she's been very badly hurt by immigration, very, very badly hurt. So China's a very rich country, as you often right. say. How many refugees and immigrants does China allow? I'd say probably none. Why is that? I'd say, uh, how about asking me about Japan? How about asking me about South Korea? How about asking me about a lot of other countries that are very successful? Uh, is there pressure on those countries to allow millions of refugees and immigrants to come in? Uh, pressure? Uh, I don't even think the people making the decision would want to waste the phone call. There's no chance. Check out Japan. Ask them, how many have you taken in the last 20 years? You can count them on your fingers. No, it's different. And Well, but wait. If the key to success as a country is immigration. I would say, well, look, I would say, those countries I'm not successful? even talking about key to success, and it depends on what immigration, what's going on. Right. But but uh, you're asking me about China, and I added yeah. Japan, I added South Korea, I could add other countries also. Uh, it is uh, virtually impossible. I'll tell you what, Mexico has very strong immigration laws. You know, if Mexico wanted, they could stop this huge flow of people coming up from different parts of South America, including Mexico and pouring into our border. Our laws are so bad. We have the worst laws anywhere in the world. We have the worst immigration laws in the world. We don't have any law. We have an opposite to law. And then on top of it, you have the right to separate children, okay? So everything's bad, but you have the right to separate children. It's, uh, it's really disgraceful that the Democrats aren't doing something about it, because we need their votes, as you know. So I hope we're going to get enough Republicans that we don't need them come November. But the Democrats, we need their votes. We have, as you know, 51. And even the 51 is not really there, for obvious reasons, uh, in the Senate. And in the House, it's fairly close. We need Democrat votes in order to get it done. And they really just want to resist. You know, the whole thing is resist, right? That's their big theme, resist. What do you get from resistance? But it's resist and obstruct. That's what they're all about. It's the only thing they're good about. They're not good politicians. They've got horrible policy, but they're very good at sticking together and resisting and obstructing. But that's hurting our country. But we'll get the immigration laws changed. President of the United States, thank you for the conversation. Thank you very much.
Well, your betters on cable news have moved on just from bemoaning the hacking of the 2016 election to warning that the United States is vulnerable this year. The question is, why is nobody taking measures to fix it, like voter ID laws or the end of Internet voting? We'll ask a member of Congress on that next. Here's Martha. Thank you, Brett. Breaking tonight. So Rand Paul has been uh, almost a man all alone in defense of the president. Tonight he is here with his side of the story. I'm Martha McCallum. Good evening, everybody. From New York. So as the president sought to shed light on what happened in Helsinki, there was this striking moment in the White House Roosevelt Room. I have a full faith in our intelligence agencies. Whoops, they just turned off the light. That must be the intelligence agencies. <laughs> there it goes. Okay bit of a light moment after he had reportedly huddled with aides to try to fix the mess that Newt Gingrich had called the biggest mistake of his presidency. Earlier tonight, I interviewed Senator Rand Paul, who spoke to the president today and says that the criticism he believes is wrong. So first of all, the president said that he misspoke when he talked about uh, whether or not he thought Russia would have been involved in meddling. He said, I meant to say that they would have been, not that they wouldn't have been. How did that register with you? Do you think that that washes? Well, I thought, I've thought all along that because we've conflated two sort of different things in the Mueller investigation, that the president's reaction is typically because he sees the Mueller investigation as an accusation of collusion, that somehow the president colluded with the Russians. And there's another aspect of the investigation that has to do with who hacked into uh, Hillary Clinton's emails and who released those to the public. And so I think those are two sort of completely different aspects, but they're in the same investigation. So I think his instinct is to push back and say, you know, there was no collusion. I was never involved with Russia, which I believe to be true. And I think there has been a partisan witch hunt to go after him to try to say somehow there was collusion with Russia. But that is separate from whether or not Russia actually hacked into Hillary Clinton's emails, which I think he accepts and I think was somewhat muddled in the initial comments from the press conference. But I think he's made more clear today. All right. John Brennan, as you know, uh, came out and said that the president's performance was treasonous in his opinion. Here is the president responding to John Brennan in an interview that will air later tonight with Tucker Carlson. Watch. I think Brennan's a very bad guy, and if you look at it, a lot of things happened under his watch. I think he's a very bad person. Your thoughts on that, Senator? You know, I agree completely. I think John Brennan's completely unhinged, and you see him now calling the president treasonous. And what should worry every American is John Brennan was in charge of the CIA, the most powerful intelligence gathering you know, group on the planet. They can absorb every bit of information you can imagine, your phone calls, your metadata, your bank records, your visa records. They could destroy any person's life. The person at the head of that turns out to be a very much a partisan, a Trump hater, and very much a uh, just someone who is, uh, you know, a Trump hater. I guess that's the best way to put it. But, uh, you know, I really am worried that he was head of the CIA for so long, harboring all of that bias. Well, well, let me ask you this, because you're concerned about all of that, and I know you are, that is one of the big concerns as we move forward, because Dan Coats has said that he believes that the attempt to meddle in the, in the midterm elections is probably more intense than it was during the presidential election. So it almost feels like perhaps rather than, you know, kind of revisiting and rehashing what happened over the last 24 hours, we need to make sure that our cybersecurity is stronger. That feels like something that the president could really be coming out very strongly on that might go more to right. actual policy and fixing things than fixing, you know, a weak the, performance in Helsinki. This, the, this has been exactly my point. The integrity of the election is the most important thing. And what we should do is learn that countries do hack into elections and try. This isn't the first time. I mean, yeah. Dove Levine studied this from Carnegie Mellon University and said that the USA hacked or tried to get involved with 80 different elections over the last 50 years. The Soviet Union has, China does. And so the rule that we should learn or the moral we should learn from this is we need to protect our elections. And there are a lot of things we could discuss, but people are so intent about making this about their hatred, yeah. their Trump derangement syndrome, that we aren't talking about really what we should do. Very and I've true. had some things like we should decentralize the elections. They are already decentralized. We should ensure that they remain decentralized, that 
there is a paper trail for every precinct, that there is a Republican and a Democrat judge, there's supposed to be, that signs off on the precinct returns, and if the vote was 1,000 to 800, by the time that gets into a computer system, someone could always call back and say, yeah. what was the vote you signed off on, and do you have a piece of paper to verify yeah. that vote? Yeah, I think that's the biggest point. I also want to just bring up one more thing, because there, you know, to that end, if the FBI is so concerned as they should be with figuring out meddling in United States elections, you would think that they would have wanted to get their hands on the actual DNC server. Here is the exchange, because there's a lot said about this, because the president brought it up the other day, um, and it was kind of poo-pooed by a Democrat who I had on last night who said it didn't matter that they didn't actually have the server. But watch this moment between Congressman Will Hurd and James Comey. So, Director, um, FBI notified the DNC um, um, f early, before any information was put on WikiLeaks, and when um, you have still been never been given access to any of the technical or the physical uh, machines that were that were that were hacked by the Russians. That's correct. Although we got the forensics from the pros that they hired, which. Uh, Again, your best uh, practice is always to get access to the machines themselves, but this, my folks tell me, was an appropriate substitute. So, what do you say to that? <laughs> Well, you're taking the word of someone else who's investigated it. No, I would think the police would only take the word of themselves when they actually investigate and look at the servers. So I don't think there's any excuse for them not having done their job better. And the thing is, is a lot of this stuff's more complicated than people would think. When you're trying to trace who actually hacked into it, because there are people who can actually put the... Uh, the type of a fingerprint on what they're doing to make themselves look like someone else. They can make them, uh, by going through several different servers, obscure where they're actually coming from. And so I don't think it's always as black and white when we say so-and-so did this hacking or didn't. And I think it would be very important that the FBI should have looked directly at the Democrat servers. Yeah. I, I mean, you know, I can see people being concerned about some of what they saw yesterday. But, boy, if this happens again, um, and you point out North Korea, China, there's a lot of bad actors out there, that would be real genuine an embarrassment uh, that the United States should be very concerned about. Senator Paul, thank you, sir. Always good to have you, you with us. Thanks. Here now, Bill Bennett, host of the Bill Bennett podcast and former Secretary of Education, also a Fox News contributor. Bill, good to have you here tonight. Good evening to you, sir. Thanks, um, What did you think? Did you watch this whole press conference live yesterday? I did. Yeah, how, I've been how did you, what was your immediate yeah, reaction? I, how did you feel when it was over? Well, when, my immediate reaction was a couple of big mistakes there that he needs to explain, um, and uh, the two of them were, you know, uh, the equivalence, the suggestion of equivalence between uh, what he, his reports he was getting from the intelligence community and what Putin was saying, uh, and, uh, you know, and the second one was, uh, you know, who, who he would believe, uh, the, the question of, uh, that he clarified today. Um, so I was bothered by it, thought he needed to clean it up, I think he cleaned it up today. But the amazing thing to me is the uh, lynch mob mentality. Uh, people are just going crazy. Um, I've heard some people compare this to Kristallnacht in Nazi Germany, to uh, Pearl Harbor, and there was even a 9-11 uh, suggestion that this was the parallel. Uh, 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 Senator Paul talked about John Brennan calling it treason. By the way, one can understand a certain reluctance on the part of the president to bless the intelligence agencies, given his experience with the FBI, with Comey and McCabe, and John Brennan was the head of the CIA. So, I mean, I, look, he, he said today, he tried to clear it up today, he basically admitted error. Some people say, well, I don't believe it, I believe what he said yesterday. The real test is what he's done. What is his policy? Uh, and his policy has been very tough on Russia. I mean, Putin said yesterday that he supported, he would have supported Trump for president, or he did support him. Why would you support a guy for president who wants to increase the American military, strengthen the hand of NATO, uh, do what President Trump has done, which has given missile defense to Poland, uh, given lethal aid to the Ukraine, thrown out uh, Russian diplomats left and right, Russian mercenaries have been killed because of our actions uh, in Syria. Uh, that, to me, is the test. Uh, it, it's better to have your talk and your language yeah. consistent no, I, with your actions. I think that, that those but, are uh, excellent act, points, Actions though. do speak louder. But, but, and then it begs this next question, which is, what happens now? And here's, here's a quote from the Wall Street Journal. Uh, By going soft on Mr. Sure. Putin, they wrote, Mr. Trump will paradoxically find it even harder 
to make deals with the Russians. So, I mean, you know, you have to look back at the whole goal of this meeting, to open dialogue. The president has said since day one that he believes that a better relationship with Russia will strengthen the United States in the end and strengthen our, our forces around the world if they can agree on some things. But, but did it make it harder for him to do exactly that? Because it seems to me that now he's going to have to be tougher than ever on Russia and on Putin in order yeah. to sort of stiffen those, those sinews, so to speak. Good, good question, Martha. Look, maybe it made it a little tougher, but I think it still matters more uh, what he does. One other thing I'd mention, and this came up in the press conference, very little comment on it. They talked about uh, gas and oil, mm -hmm. uh, and we know that Russia is basically a gas station, an economy with one product. That's right. And Putin said it's very important that those prices don't plummet. Mm -hmm. uh, why is it so important? Because if they plummet, Russia's out of business. If we start exporting nat liquid natural gas uh, at, at a great rate, which we are beginning to do, uh, that is a very tough measure. Yeah. It won't be hard for, for the president to do that and for American industry to do it, uh, and I, I expect he will. So uh, I think Putin is whistling in the dark, hoping maybe that nice talk or what he interprets yeah, as nice that, talk that is such will a carry great over point. into action. You know, and, and they were talking about the so. deal with Germany to bring that pipeline through. And essentially, in criticizing that deal when he was in Europe, the president was sort of opening up that question yeah. and saying, and he said this in the news conference, too, and as you say, it didn't get a lot of attention. He basically said, well, we, we can provide that service, too, um, and may the best person win. So he's, uh, yeah. he's essentially, which I thought was a fascinating yeah, that's right moment. Um, he's basically saying, you know, we're going to compete with you on natural gas, uh, you know, and, and you are so right. Energy, they are a one trick pony, that economy, and that is all right. they have. Right. One other thing Free I want to ask. competitive capitalism, and let's see. Yeah. Let's well, see who wins. Other, yeah, go ahead. Sure. One other thing I want to ask you about, just going back to the intelligence agencies for a moment, because I couldn't help but think, you know, watching all of this and, and watching how problematic it has been in so many ways. You have to ask yourself, if, jo if John Brennan and James Comey had given the Trump campaign a defensive briefing on all of this, which they considered doing, going to them and saying, here's what we know, here's what we're concerned about, we wouldn't be here today discussing any of this, most yeah. likely. And so they are to That's blame right. in that That's sense. Right. Yeah, there was a history of inaction during the Obama yeah. administration, all, all that ever happened between the Obama administration uh, and, uh, and the Putin uh, administration was the reset button and that whisper by Obama that he'd be more flexible, That's which right. didn't get nearly any of the attention that this thing got, you know, and it was really quite an extraordinary moment. Uh, so, so no, you're, you're absolutely right. And this explains, I think, why the president is reluctant to do full embrace. But he did full embrace this afternoon of Dan Coats and the intelligence community. And the only thing I'd, I'd like to add or suggest is that he say, this better not happen in 2018, or we'll send more liquefied natural gas, and we'll send more, build more missile defense, and we'll build our military even more. Those are the real threats. Uh, to Putin, not some words misplaced or not yeah. at a press conference. That's I, what Putin's I think that's a great about. point. I, I mean, you know, if, if that is the the uh, the sort of carrot and stick, you know, we're not going to have these meetings anymore. If we see any meddling in the 2018 election, um, you're going to be cut off and isolated, which is what they exactly what they don't want. Um, so the actions from here forward right. are going to be incredibly important uh, as everybody judges this relationship. Um, Bill, thank you. Always good to exactly see you, sir. Right. Thanks for being here tonight. Thank you. So coming up, Maria Butina. She's 29 years old and she's an American University grad. Our former KGB agent is back tonight with a look at how many Marias the Russians may have here in the United States. And remember this. We need to rebuild our immigration system from top to bottom, starting by replacing ICE. So what happened when Republicans tried to call their bluff